Hi, good morning, everybody. I just want to welcome you to the Politics of Being, Spiritual Wisdom for a New Development Paradigm. Our presenter today is Mr. Thomas Legrand, and this is part of World Unity Week and um, the Sacred Space and Talking Circles Convergence Board and uh, hosted by uh, the Sacred Earth Council. Go ahead, Tomas. Thank you, Lina. Hello, everybody. It's uh, great to be with you today uh, as part of the World Unity Week. I'm very happy to be able to, to share my work uh, on the politics of being, which is a, a book I'm currently finalizing. So I'm, I'm happy to talk uh, with you from the southwest of France. I live next to the Plum Village Monastery of Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh, where we practice mindfulness. And I, I propose to start this session with three sound of the bell to get us uh, rooted, coming back to our body, to our breathing, and to the present moment. Thank you all. I'm Thomas Legrand. So I, I have studied um, different things, um, uh, political science, international development. I have a PhD in ecological economics and I work uh, in, on uh, sustainable development issues with um, United Nations development agencies and uh, businesses and NGOs. I've been involved in, uh, in some uh, strategic assignments, for example, when we need to uh, design the, the vision for uh, the green development of, of a country, for example. Um, but I have found that even in, this, um, in these occasions, I almost never have the opportunity to be able to discuss what I will present uh, today and a more fundamental shift in the way we envision uh, development and how our uh, societies could, um, could evolve. So indeed, I think there is um, an increasing uh, realization that we need a cultural evolution. We have um, very uh, big problems to address right now. We have the, the technology in principle to, to solve them but we are not doing it. Why? So we can see that in the last, uh, we have entered the Anthropocene where uh, we have become, uh, as humans, the main geological force on Earth. Uh, our technological power has grown a lot over the last centuries, but our wisdom uh, has not accompanied this growth. And we have prioritized the material aspects of our lives and pay less attention, neglecting the moral ethics and the inner dimensions. So I think there is an increasing uh, realization that there is a need for a cultural evolution. And what many of us believe is that this cultural evolution is by nature, in essence, spiritual. Uh, in, er, in the Earth Charter, which is an important uh, document, uh, it talks about a change of mind and heart. So indeed, we think these cultural evolutions need to be so profound, so all-encompassing, 
and it touched about the very meaning of our lives, what we set as priorities. And as we will see, spiritual teachings uh, can really, and our wisdom, have a lot to do about how we can successfully deal with uh, the challenges that are, that are coming and already now. So um, many traditions have talked about the spiritual evolution of humankind and that uh, a new earth will, will, will come at some point where our where we live together will be much more harmonious. In the last two centuries, there are some people who have, uh, especially at the, um, evolu the science of evolution uh, developed, uh, some people have had um, a spiritual vision of it, where we all not only have biological evolution, but also more consciousness uh, as we, um, as different species, develop. The, the founder of the Baha'i religion, Baha'u'llah, predict that uh, we were about to see the coming of age of humanity, where humanity becomes really adult. So we have to understand that what we are living now is an evolutionary crisis. Uh, we have a, a certain uh, development model, a certain paradigm of modernity, a uh, development model based on economic growth, as started from the West and as expanded through globalization. And it is based on a certain number of key values on philosophical foundation, which are, for example, materialism, reductionism, individualism, and this cultural program has brought a lot of positive outcomes, scientific, technological development, a focus on human rights, uh, but it also uh, brought an increasingly more and more ecological and social programs. And it has not been able to favor, as we have seen, the growth of our, uh, of our wisdom. So we need cultural evolution is about changing these uh, philosophical foundation, these values that are at the very root of our societies. Um, our teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, said uh, the way out is in. And we have said that this cultural evolution needs to be in a sense spiritual. Um, Charles Eisenstein has talked about uh, moving from the story of separation to the story of interbeing, recognizing that basically all our societies are based on, um, on some key answers they provide to eternal questions about what are humans, what we are doing here, where we come from, where we are heading to. So uh, there is a need for this new story uh, that will move us from uh, us acting mostly uh, as maximizing all material self-interest, which is at the basis of many of our institutions right now, to move to, when we move to the story of interbeing, we can feel we relate, we are part of a community. We are part of, of human beings, but also non-human beings. We are part of the Earth's family. And as we grow into adulthood, we can, we, can, we can become responsible member of this family. When I'm dealing with me and my family, I don't think about what is my interest. I think about what is right for me to do for my children, for my wife. So it's time now to really um, Base the way also extend this logic to uh, how we deal at the social level. So there is a need for a new development paradigm. Even uh, Ban Ki Moon, the UN, uh, when he was Secretary General of the UN, said the old model is broken. We need a new one. Uh, there's a lot of proposed new paradigm. 
And often I see they don't go far enough. They don't so much change from the old paradigm. And I think the, the, what we can, the easiest thing to do is to recognize that it's at the most fundamental level, it's a change from having to being. We need a more integral development, not only about the material aspects, but also about our inner lives. And this has been recognized in the Earth Charter. It says that when basic needs have been made, development is, pr is primarily about being more rather than having more. And there's a lot of science now that um, back this affirmation. We know that when we reach a certain level of material prosperity, then, um, then our, um, our well-being or happiness does not much uh, improve with more stuff, you know, with more having. Um, it's more about individual qualities, the quality of our relationship. It's much more qualitative and relates to our being. Even uh, sociologists, um, for example, Ro Ronald Engelhardt is the most recognized sociologist studying the evolution of global values. And it says that basically um, what we are undergoing is a big cultural transformation uh, in, in rich countries from um, materialist to post-materialist values. But much more generally, this is part of a longer trend from what he calls survival value to self-expression value. So there's a, a good deal of science that can really back this uh, new um, paradigm. Uh, so the politics of being is a politics that can move us into that direction. And it places the fulfillment of, full, of all beings as its main objective. So, I think it's really, um, it really makes sense, you know, to have all fulfillment. Um, material prosperity should only be a mean to achieve happiness, fulfillment. Uh, somehow along the way, it has become now a goal in itself, and that has created a lot of imbalances. So what we mean by the politics of being is bringing the condition that allow each being to express its full potential. And our institution should nourish the greatest qualities in all individuals. Indeed, um, we often tend to, uh, when we talk about this shift of consciousness, usually we think about it at the individual level, like everybody goes through its own process of, of growth, of realization, and maybe through some spiritual practices such as meditations and people change their mindsets, their worldviews, and little by little, as more individuals change, our institutions will change also to adapt. But so here I'm asking a, com a complementary question is, what kind of institutions will embody this change of consciousness? And what kind of institutions can facilitate uh, or inner development can facilitate this process. And here again, the best uh, scientists are exactly pointing in that direction. Eleanor Ostrom is argu arguably the, the most influential scholar in, um, in institutional analysis. So when she receives the, the Nobel Prize in economics, uh, she synthesized what she learned over the last 50 years. And she said, uh, desi designing institutions, uh, sorry, I can't read that, based, I guess, on entirely assuming that they are un based on entirely self-interested individuals to achieve better outcomes has been the major goal posited by policy analysts for governments to accomplish for much of the past half century. Extensive empirical research leads me to argue that instead, the core goal of public policy should be to facilitate the development of institutions 
that bring out the best in humans. So this is really uh, a strong endorsement of our vision. So what does that mean in practice? I will take an example of the kind of policy that we need to promote. The kind of policy that not only address a specific goal at the sectorial level, but does address these needs, these social needs, by, through a human technology, uh, through which we, uh, as individuals, we practice uh, the highest values. And that allows not only to deal with justice, because the same individuals will behave then in a different way in all other aspects of their lives. So right now, the paradigm in justice, for example, is retributive justice. It means that there is justice when we break the law, receive a proportional punishment. And this paradigm is now increasingly recognized as failing. Uh, there are rising delays and costs, mass incarceration, recidivism, uh, the needs of victims and offenders are unfulfilled. So there's a clear need, as in every sector, that we need to change the paradigm. And the, uh, the main uh, paradigm proposed as an alternative is called uh, restorative justice. It's a non-adversarial process which brings stakeholders together and through dialogue, a victim and offenders together, and also the community, and through dialogue, they can agree on um, how the, the harm that has been done can be repaired and we can have healing and reintegration. And indeed, the studies show there are very high satisfaction rates from victims and offenders. It has the potential to reduce the cost of doing justice and increase the response to crime efficiency. And also in terms of reoffending, it performs slightly better. So we see here, like, imagine, imagine for a moment, like, because restorative justice can deal with a lot of uh, issues. So imagine where everybody involved in justice is being involved through restorative justice. Then that would be an opportunity to develop the highest qualities of, um, let's say, empathy, respect, presence, courage, responsibility. So that we build the, the space where a deep conversation can happen and where healing can happen. So imagine if, you know, everything that we do in society, whether it is in justice or in health or in, in education, not only fulfills the need for justice, health and education, but also help build, uh, grow better uh, human beings. So that's a vision we have. And I think we can find policy that can enable to do so in all sectors. So, you know, why, why does it matter? Let's come back just a, a bit to that a bit theoretically. Um, uh, uh, spiritual evolution, why does it matter for sustainability? Um, we know that our economic system play on ego-centered, disconnected individual. That's how we have the best consumers, that how we supposed to have um, ambitious workers, competitive uh, investors also that, you know, wants to do a lot of money. Uh, so let's, let's have a look what, what is the fundamental uh, mystical experience. It's now that mystics from all over the world are coming together and sharing their experience, we realize that uh, the common experience, it's about oneness. It's about interbeing. It's about unity consciousness where uh, we feel part of everything that is, we feel connected. And, and as we feel connected, we cannot, we don't want to, to arm. Uh, we, we want to, to nourish all that is around us. Okay, we, not everybody will have this kind of experience, but I think uh, 
as spiritual evolution goes, we nourish and we feel more connected to oneself, to nature, and to other humans. And science is telling us that this is what makes us happy. And this is what brings us to adopt behaviors that are more positive for society. So I think here again, there is a, a strong rationale for explaining you know, how spiritual evolution can uh, help us and brings us towards sustainability. Uh, I mean by spiritual evolution, expressing this true nature of interconnectedness. And I mean cultivating our, our higher selves, the highest qualities. So indeed, nations to thrive need to cherish high ideals. We find them in most of the national motto. Truth alone triumphs is the Indian national motto. Liberty, equality, fraternity, friends official motto. Or the American Declaration of Independence that recognizes unalienable rights to, uh, sorry, I can't write well, can't read well, freedom, uh, liberty and the pursuit, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, yeah, I can move that. Okay, good. So indeed, uh, these spiritual values, I call them spiritual values because they reflect the spirit. They reflect what truly awakened person manifest. And these spiritual values are the foundation of the politics of being, as they are the foundations of probably most of the, the states as reflected in the nationalist motto. Um, indeed, you know, Plato, uh, he talks about the, um, uh, what is that? The truth, goodness, and beauty. Um, the transcendentals, he called that. And that has been very influential about what are the, the foundation of, of the good society. Uh, liberalism has emphasized freedom. Uh, abundance and prosperity, we have been a lot into that, but with a narrow view of only through material means. Pro abundance can go much beyond that. As we are looking for this cultural evolution, it is now time for us to evolve collectively. Other spiritual values are coming forth. They are becoming subject of science. They are entering the political field. I'm talking about systemic and complex thinking. Uh, the fact that all is interrelated as all spiritual traditions tell. I'm talking about life, not only as something to respect, but also as something to, which has a wisdom. Uh, there are principles of life that we need to align with. That is recognized now in the Buen Vivir uh, political philosophy in South America, or in the fact that China has committed to become an ecological civilization. And that resonates with China cultural foundations, such as Taoism, for example. Uh, happiness, you know that now some countries have, have made happiness instead of, of uh, economic growth their priority, gross national happiness. Talking about love and empathy. Talking about peace. There are peace studies in the 50s. It's quite new. But we are now able to, we know what, how we can develop culture of peace. There have been re UN resolution in that sense. Mindfulness. A group of more than 100, I think, uh, members of parliament in the UK have designed a plan called UK Mindful Nation. So all of these, we can build on all of these to design the, the politics of being. Um, so indeed, we, it does not mean that traditional policies, you know, in many countries and they probably still remain, but they need to be completed by others' policies that embodies this interbeing paradigm. 
which cultivate our human, social, and natural potential. So as I've said, you know, all these new values have come with policy proposals. They are labeled in different words. Integral, holistic, regenerative, positive, compassionate, caring, non-violent, mindful. All of this, you can you take hold of this, and usually you have mindful health, integral politics, uh, regenerative economy. So you take all these adjectives and you can have and you can have policies in many sectors. So we can bring all that together to design this uh, uh, politics of being. And indeed, when we look at the, the paradigmatic changes that are at work in many sectors, we find out that they are part of this, of this new interbeing paradigm. It's about changing what we do, changing our policies, but also changing how we do it. Another example of key policies, early childhood well-being. So it's, I mean, what happens in uh, the very first years of our life will determine a lot of what is coming next. And that psychologists have known that for a while already. And it's decisive to not only to build the well-being, the health of adults later, but also how people will be able to contribute positively or negatively to our communities. So we need to mainstream developmental screening to ensure that all children have access to quality nutrition, to education, to healthcare, to all their basic needs. And that goes beyond material needs. That we know that I mean, psychologists know very well that what children need more fundamentally, what my children need more fundamentally is my love. It's my presence. And public policies can foster that. You know, in the, it's no surprise that European Nordic countries, which, you know, you go to every ranking, international ranking on happiness or social health, they are always at the top. They offer 16 months of parental leaves. <laughs> some of them. In the US, it's the only developed country with no federal paid leave policy. So that has, will have a lot of impact on how then human beings develop. Um, parenting programs, they have been very successful in uh, uh, promoting effective parenting that is both uh, responsive and demanding for children. And here again, the value of compassion, of mindfulness are increasingly recognized. Traumas prevention, detection, and healing. It's a shame that in many of our societies, it, there's no proper system to deal with that. And when we know it has huge consequences, it has a huge impact on society. And Indeed, it's even a good, uh, even from an economic point of view, it's even a good investment. It has, been, um, it has been shown that every dollar invested in childhood well-being in the US can generate $8 for society. So why we don't do that is just like our paradigm, our current paradigm does not deal with the inner dimension. And we have reached the limit of that. Another example, mental health. So um, it's also, I mean, it's the basic of uh, human flourishing and health. Uh, it's defined by uh, the World Health Organization as a state of well-being in which every ind individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to her or his community. So we, we see that it's very important for every individual, but also for societies, that we can develop good mental health. We know that uh, one in three individuals in the world will experiment during their life a severe mental health problem. It's a huge burden. And it's Again, it's really incredible that only, even in rich countries, only 
less than a third of people suffering mental illness access to treatments. And there are cost-effective treatments and, and uh, with potentially positive returns, not only for, uh, for societies. So, I mean, it's, it should really be a priority of, uh, of a politics of being. Another paradigm, recognizing nature's rights. So now we have numerous countries have recognized rights for mothers, for particular rivers, specific forests, mountains, animals, including great apes and dolphins. Uh, we have a universal declaration on the rights of Mother Earth. And yeah, the idea is that um, a planet where only human beings have rights uh, is disbalanced. We have to recognize that we are only one part of the Earth community. Each member of this community has rights and we need to find a balance between these different rights because all well-being depends on the well-being of all the parts of a system we are part of. So this uh, recognizing the rights of nature, I mean, then we'll have um, uh, courts that can be, and, and there is experience of that because there is experience in different rights needing to be balanced. So the courts will have to question, you know, our unlimited rights to exploit the earth. Um, and it will, uh, we, we need to ask us, you know, what do we really need as human beings to strive? How we can fulfill our material needs in a way that minimizes the impact on our environments. So through the recognizing natural rights, we can become responsible members of the Earth's community. So there, um, on, on the book I'm writing, I have developed, um, I'm, I'm addressing these paradigmatic changes and what kind of public policies and strategic approach we can take in all sectors. And what is an education of being more integral? Uh, and we can see that the best scientific literature will point to uh, uh, an education that is more personalized, that is focused on character and personal um, um, strength, and value on interdisciplinary topics that can help us to develop uh, systemic thinking, complex thinking, etc. Um, we can have, um, we need to change our diet, we know, to deal uh, with the ecological crisis. Agroecology uh, is also the new, uh, the coming paradigm in agriculture. It's about working not against nature, but with nature. It's a complex endeavor. Uh, and there's a lot of traditional wisdom and ecological knowledge that can fit into that. We need to have the sacred sites managed by indigenous people because they know, they know that the earth is a being and that has also an energetic dimension that needs to be nourished through our love. And indigenous people everywhere in the world knows how to do that in their sacred sites, which are, which are energetic um, places. Uh, mine, so there's a lot of these, um, okay, there's a lot of these um, um, different approaches in all we need to review completely our economic system. Uh, especially we need more, much equal, uh, so we need much less inequalities. Uh, we know that, I mean, it has been proven that inequalities are the, the roots of so much social issues. And a more equality is, can benefit everyone. Um, we need to review all our democratic systems work. Right now, we don't have the, we don't have the, we're not developing the right skills for deliberation, non-partisanship. Um, 
So all our institutions have to change and they are already, we can find, uh, you know, what uh, politics of being means in all sectors. Sorry, I can't. Can I move to the next slide? Oh, let me see. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. Okay, so like individuals, when nations flourish and develop higher qualities and value, they contempor contemporaneously express their uniqueness and universal natures. So we can have, as we, spiritual evolution can bring us towards a, a more unified world at the same time that it can help nations embody their specificity. So each nation needs to define its own version of the politics of being, its own version of the good life. And the map here showed that indeed uh, this cultural change, this cultural evolution is past dependent, which means it depends on where we come from in terms of history, in terms of, of gene, of culture, of religions, and here are the two most, on this map, we show two most fundamental dimensions of cultural evolution per Ingel Art. So one is as we develop, let's say, we move to more rational, secular rational values, and we are moving more toward self-expression values. And we see that there are very clear uh, cultural zones. And each of these cultures, each of these nations have to define their own views. They have to, so it's, um, and indeed they, they have to come back for this to happen. They have to come back to their traditional wisdom. They have to reconnect themselves. In many countries, there is this traditional wisdom is often recapped in one word, captured in one word. Pura Vida, pure life in Costa Rica. Ubuntu in South Africa. Capua in the Philippines. And unlike Western emphasis on individuality, most of this traditional wisdom emphasizes our relational nature or belonging towards a community and responsibilities towards a community. A community which often includes ancestors, spiritual beings, and all life forms. So we need to, every nation needs to reconnect to its wisdom, to its soul. Um, so we need also, we need to move the, the kind of political discussions we have toward the, the, the inner dimensions. You know, we need to recapitulate, recap our history as is now happening in the US. Uh, we need to reconnect to, we need to perform collective, collective psychological assessments. How are we as collective being? What are our strengths or weaknesses? What have we have difficulties to see? We need to reconnect with the soul of our nation and discover its purpose. The purpose of the US is clearly to bring about the, to pilot how we can live together from different cultures, people from different cultures, pilot that in one country. The US needs to reconnect to its purpose and that, and take that will change how the US behave in the world. So this new paradigm of being or into being, it's, we have seen that it's for healthy people, it's a natural way of behaving. The thing is that we are not used to do that in societies. And the main reason is that because we have been under the, the grasp of traumas, traumas that can be multi-generational today in the, in this space, we'll have a, a discussion on intergenerational trauma. So healing this trauma is fundamental to be able to move toward that new paradigm. So these politics of being, I think we, we, we need to be built on science, the best of science and spiritual wisdom, inter-spirituality, the wisdom from all traditions, the wisdom of this planet. We, we, 
we can have a strong rationale, I think, for the politics of being rooted in science and make it understandable by decision makers by speaking their language of economy, of social science, psychological science, and we can keep it simple for everybody to understand that. What I want to offer also is a simple and integral conceptual framework. Uh, usually, uh, some people emphasize one dimension, let's say, life, systemic thinking, compassion, love. I think being is uh, the whole of these things, and we can provide that in, uh, in, in a common framework. We can speak the same language and recover, we can recognize this is all part of the same journey of the same proposal for humanity so this is a collective endeavor um, i hope to be able to to bring this uh, book uh, next year uh, i will look soon for a publisher so any advice are welcome and connect uh, to the facebook page and the upcoming website uh, we need to to uh, all expertise and from different fields we need all wisdom from all traditions we need support by everybody to be able to, to build these new politics together. So now we will have a, a, a Q&A uh, session of um, 10 minutes, and then uh, we will break out in groups for discussions, for talking circles. And, um, and before we come back and share um, what we have discussed and, and, and conclude. Uh, maybe Lena, I don't know if you want to, or someone has, uh, if you want to yeah. facilitate so that. If you could yeah. stop sharing your screen so we okay. can see you. And then for people that have questions, you can raise your hand um, in the, under participants. Um, there's an option there if you open the participant window to raise your hand and Jan's uh, it has the first uh, one up. Hi, Tomas. Are you ready for my question? Yes, I am. Thank Jen. you for your beautiful, beautiful talk and your work. My goodness, I'm so excited. Uh, and how lovely when we, I'm a psychologist and an astrologer. And I've also been doing some deep work in eco psychology. So one of my uh, tips is you may, there's a book and I'll find it. And, and reference it, they're doing some wonderful work out of Pacifica in California, you may know that, and, and they've published some amazing books on eco-psychology and these kinds of issues, and perhaps that's a lead for you as a publisher. As an astrologer, I've done some work on the Silk Roads, and um, also, again, just as an aside, for, for many years, I owned a seat on the American Stock Exchange. I inherited it, and so this inter, interbeing of, of, of commerce and people getting along. And it seemed to me that the Silk Roads and the exchange of ideas through commerce, people were intermarrying, cultures were intermingled. Uh, there was a great exchange of knowledge. Um, do you see the Silk Road as, how can you see economics then that kind of interbeing easily marrying uh, when people just are near each other and, uh, and um, sharing cultures in that way? Yeah. Uh, sh shall I take uh, different questions and see, um, see if there's other questions before answering? Uh, thanks a lot, Jen. Well, maybe I can start with this one. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're true that uh, commerce uh, have brought a lot of exchange of ideas and that's a lot. It's, now, it's no surprise that now at the time of globalization, uh, driven by trade, um, and there's so much exchange of ideas, and that is bringing this cultural evolution, and I, especially as we can tap on all, uh, on the experience of all nations, of all wisdom. So, um, in terms of um, commerce and economics, so that's a whole, uh, I have a, a chapter, I've worked on that. Uh, I actually think that we probably need to, um, to undo a bit of globalization, as of economic globalization in terms of free trade and um, free um, circulation of, uh, of uh, financial flows. Um, but I also believe that our economic uh, paradigm will, uh, will give more space for uh, companies 
that are much more oriented toward the public good and even that can make uh, their main purpose not become profit, but other things. And, and even as societies, um, I mean, we, our governments are giving license to operate to companies so we can decide, you know, for example, that only companies that have certain standards or certain, or govern in a certain way, uh, we could decide to build uh, our economic systems with only that kind of companies. And indeed, even without regulation, we see that is happening. I don't know if you have heard about this book from uh, uh, Frédéric Laloux, uh, Reinventing Organizations. And it shows that many companies now are, you know, undergoing this change of paradigm uh, based on three aspects. Uh, one is um, freedom, like everybody in these companies have the right to take any decisions. So there is no control, there is no, it's just amazing how it works. And it happens more and more and in big companies and they are very profitable, by the way, even if profit is not their main focus sometimes. And they also help people to be more themselves at work. So that's typically aligned with the politics of being. And, and they, they, there's one dimension it calls listening to evolutionary purpose. So people in these organizations are constantly asking, you know, what is the organization asking us to do? Where does it move? Like as if the company has a soul in itself. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, so even, and indeed I, I would emphasize that, that this change of paradigm is we need to move away a bit from the stick and carrot, uh, uh, carrot and stick in, uh, incentives way of doing. This is okay to deal with children, but as we become adults, uh, the way we behave has more to come from intrinsic motivation. And that's basically exactly what uh, Lalou has documented when he reviews how these kind of companies operate. So the same for, uh, I mean, we can put taxis and try to align uh, companies on the better goods, but I think it can be more powerful uh, to just call for people to um, to to the goodwill of people and to, to form a coalition. And this way we can be, uh, have a lot of freedom, but also use this freedom in a good way. Otherwise we need to restrain this freedom if it arms the common good and it threatens our very future. So yeah, I hope this uh, Thank you for your answer. And I wanna also support as a psychologist that all the research shows when people are healthy, they naturally do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. I think Dominic uh, raising his hand. Yep, Dominic. Hello there. Th thank you for that very interesting, stimulating, and very wide, very, very wide-ranging uh, presentation. You've got some very good ideas going on there. Um, I, I represent World Goodwill, and and uh, our organisation focuses on these sorts of issues as well. Uh, we have a newsletter where we reflect on these kind of issues and also webinars, et cetera. But what I wanted, what I wanted to ask you about was, um, I didn't see in your presentation very much emphasis on the United Nations and the sustainable development goals. Maybe I missed that, that there might have been a couple of slides that I missed at the start. Um, and I just wanted to, to ask you how you saw that kind, the kind of approach that you're talking about, uh, interspirituality and interbeing, integrating with that agenda. agenda. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Dominic. Um, yeah, I think there are very uh, important points in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. But some of these things, for example, on early um, childhood well-being, uh, I think is reflected there. Um, I think one thing that is very important, if I come back to the, this very sentence from the Earth Charter, when basic needs have been met, development is more about being more than having more. And the, the SDGs are a lot about these basic needs being met for everybody. And this is the material basis that we need for cultural evolution. I mean, it's clear from sociological research that we need, we need to move away from survival values, as I said, uh, which means everybody needs to have uh, his livelihoods 
uh, secured. And uh, SDG, uh, this is a goal of the SDG. So there's a lot of, um, of, um, of common ground. Um, the only thing I would, uh, I would, I feel the SDG are not yet out of the um, economic growth paradigm at, at the kind of at the center. So that's a bit the, the, um, the reservation I have, but I think they embody a very high uh, ethical uh, standards and um, that's uh, already uh, wonderful and it's really important to, to support this uh, agenda. Maybe it would have been great to have, I don't know, the, you know, being, I don't, I don't think it should be an SDG in itself, but it could be more uh, of kind of a, a cultural evolution, uh, uh, um, a a rational that could accompany uh, the SDG. Well, let's hope maybe in 2030 they'll add that in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When I read the, um, before the SDG, you know, at the time where Ban Ki moon was calling for this change of paradigm, there was a proposal from Bhutan to make happiness a new development paradigm. And, mm. and when I read that, I thought, wow, if we can adopt that in 2015, like we're kind of one generation ahead, like we would have <laughs> gained. Uh, but I think, yeah, we are not collectively ready. So let's hope for 2030, yeah. <laughs> Indeed, thank you. Thank you. I see Ejna has a question. And then, we, then we'll be at our 10 minutes. Hi there. Yeah, I guess it's kind of more like a comment or um, that uh, Zach Bush is working with the culture of the farm industry in the middle Midwest of the United States. And that culture is very set in its ways about um, how farming practices. And they've killed most of the soil in the Midwest of the United States. The dirt is dead. The, there are no more earthworms. And so he, but we, he, but research shows that the minute they start to get, bring the soil back to life, it happens very, very quickly. So he's been able to convince some of the farmers and is working with them. But what happens in, is that if one farmer goes against the culture of the whole farm industry, they're shunned, they're ostracized. And so what he's trying to do is to create coalitions of people who are holding this new information and this new knowledge so that maybe in a cohort, they can maybe impact the change in this culture. And I just wondered if you know of any other instances like this, because it's, the cultures in all of these spheres are so entrenched and, and how it is, how can it be possible to impact, you know, for, you know, for shift. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Rizna. Uh Yeah, I mean, I think um, coming together is the most important thing, you know, when you are in this kind of, um, that's what we do in World Unity Week. When you have two paradigms that are, the question is how best do we coordinate ourselves, uh, people who believe in this new paradigm? So, being able to 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 come together and form organizations and exchange ideas and spread ideas and 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 develop community i think it's very important as you said people feel ostracized so i think it's very important to offer uh, and you know that's what i feel here in Plum Village. you have been there uh, uh, Ejna. and I, I think when people come here they really feel well they really feel respected they feel loved and they feel like, wow, that's, we have a friend, you know, from, uh, from uh, Liberia. He was uh, an ex-general that was uh, during the Civil War. And at some point he met some people from um, Everyday Gandhi. And he was still a, a paramilitary and he was going to make another civil war in another country, neighboring country. And he said, okay, uh, I, will, I will talk with these guys because they were stuck in, uh, in the mud somewhere in Africa. And, um, 
they and they say oh, i will talk to this guy they are peaceful activists uh, they will treat me bad they will look at me down and but just i would check you know and he found that he was so well welcome that he did not go to a neighboring country to do a civil war he just changed his way and stay with them and because he felt there was so much love and respect for him and then he and then he has come here he has practiced mindfulness meditation he has healed traumas and he has spent years uh, here in the, the monastery and now he's advocating for peace so i think this is very important to create communities and these communities to be not to confront but being always open for newcomers for people who change their mind and 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 people can feel you know the kind of energy there and i think that's how change is happening also more and more people feel like okay there is less and less uh, happiness less and less fun and uh, into these kind of communities that are now becoming in, the, in a system that is becoming so destructive and they can feel like in other communities that embodies this different paradigm they can feel they can touch uh, happiness they can touch love so i hope this answers your question <laughs> <laughs> oh and there was a question about um Tomas, about the book mm -hmm. reference you had? Yeah, I think I've entered that uh, in the chat. Uh, also, oh, someone was also answered. Uh, that was in private. Yeah, Reinventing Organizations by Frédéric Laloux. Thank okay. you, Lawrence. I know you love this book. <laughs> uh, okay, so any more questions before we go to breakout? So Alenka says, I witness as a photographer for Plastic Bank visit from CEO of Henkel and Schwarzkopf opening new centers for collecting plastic from beaches and rivers in exchange for money. Um, but it all went. Hi, maybe Hi. I should. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, maybe it's nicer if I explain. <laughs> I want it captured for the recording. That's it's so a, no problem. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm from Slovenia. I am an um, artist and um, ecologist, and um, I do many things, but the most about this Haiti and the Henkel and the Plastic Bank. Uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> and the Plastic Bank is um, basically an um, organization that manages how to help the poor uh, in the areas where they have plastics all around to, to collect and exchange for the for the um, for example for education whatever it's like a whole system but the point they were opening a new uh, collector centers in haiti and i was there witnessing this taking pictures uh, but the point was of the ceo of the henkel she was there with the crew decision makers on the spot where this land are really horrible you can't in um, the smell and uh, you never forget that so people who are actually making a big decision in this kind of corporations as henkel were there and they actually felt the impact of um, they actually changed their um, management i mean decisions when they came back they make test year of the new recycle, I mean, this recycled plastic so that plastic bank would have money to do more collecting. So they kind of signed the deal and now they are recycling this plastic um, in order to support these poor people who can actually earn money this way. But also the Schwarzkopf and this, they will use this recycled plastic for, uh, uh, for the shampoos and this. So this is maybe a um, good practice um, from the top down that they were invited to the environment and then bring a change into the into the organization and actually change this the the way of it it, it impact them so much they, they say it's never the same when you see the picture but really when you step on that land with this smell and the, you see the people live there you can't forget that yeah. So I think it's a it's a impact on the people who are making decisions. They should be uh, kind of 
dragged into situations or this is a good situation or a bad, but you know, that is really related to them and it's hard to communicate with that. But I do this with uh, art photography. I choose the topic that it's connected to, to something like, for example, extinction of uh, mountain Bosnian horses. And then when I have art exhibition, I invite uh, people from my network, which are totally different fields. But when they hear it and see it through art, and that's a beauty, a beautiful thing. So, and I am more to the beauty thing. I like to present what is beautiful and invite people to beauty. So this Haiti experience was very, very exceptional for me. And they also told me to prepare, but it was a really part. <laughs> am I too long? I'm sorry. <laughs> yep. No, you're fine. Thank you, Anka, for your work. Yeah. We need, a, we need beauty. Yeah. I also prepared something for the Unity Week with the Neil Golden. It's a video of the eight minutes and 34 uh, three thirds um, that presents the George Floyd uh, death, the last eight minutes, and also the uh, Chief Phil Lane portraits that I did with the with the with the special technique. Sorry, we just close. You can hear it. Um, Anyway, I did the art show that it's not yet featuring, but when it will be, I hope these days that you can see it. It's a portrait through this uh, eight minutes or something, uh, like uh, you go through this um, experience, but there are portraits of uh, Chief Phil Lane and from, uh, from the paintings from the artist uh, about the Floyd. So I try to touch base with art. Yeah. Wonderful. Can welcome everybody back from the breakout rooms and we'll get ready to go with the next step. Tomas, do you want to lead us? Um, okay, so um, um, uh, I hope you have enjoyed your uh, your talking circle. It was great uh, to hear everybody in, in ours. Um, before we move that, maybe just mention that if you want to have some news, like when the book goes up, please leave your, uh, your emails and we can keep in touch or you can... Uh, you can, uh, there is a Facebook page also on the politics of being. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, um, open this circle. Uh, is everybody that wants to share his own thing or what, he, what they, you have found in your talking circle? Uh, I think also uh, Jen, Jen uh, wanted to share. So maybe uh, if you feel like it, you can start, Jane. And oh, we can, thank uh, you and so much. Just briefly, because we just kind of, Anyway, uh, I was responding to um, uh, one, of the, one of the people in our group had said, what do I do? How do I put these things into action? Uh, and, and what helped me, because it was a very, it's such a broad field to jump into, uh, I got some guidance, uh, again, through one of my uh, classes in eco-psychology, which was to just start where you are. Uh, if you're if you're a psychologist, start in the realm of psychology. Uh, that it's a broad field. There's room for all of what we, there's need for all of what we do. So for me, I was ranging so far afield, and it was getting overwhelming. And I just shored it up, and you know, made it what I already know how to do, and expanding from there. So I wanted to to add that. And then just the the last thought, because I am somewhat familiar with the goals, the sustainable development goals, and things like that. And I, I don't want to introduce a debate about something very, again, polarizing, we're in polarity, but who decides, who's the ultimate decider or how are decisions made about highly polarizing issues like vaccination, for example, because one of the healthy childhood goals is to have every child vaccinated. And that's such a polarizing issue. So, and, and one of the other members of our group was also talking about how are these decisions made? How do cultures come together when they may have very differing views about things? So that was a kind of a question and a comment and, and that's my share, uh, personal share, thank you. Please feel free to, 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 to circle is open. 
there's a there's a very strange and odd commodity I'm missing on the planet right now. It's called the truth. It's called the truth. What is the truth? What is true? True is truth is universal or absolute. What's true for you is true for me. Now, if you think otherwise, I think you think wrongly. Uh, is there, you know, truth belongs to its attributes belong to God, and we reflect them. We reflect them in our heart, in our mind, in our soul. The truth. There's not one God. There's I mean, there's one God. There's one one truth, and it belongs to us all. It's relative, based on our stage of development, perhaps, but it's it's one. So if if a vaccine poisons uh, a being, it poisons a being, whether whether you say it doesn't or you know, what what is the truth of the matter? I guess is always the question. Uh, so that would be, I think when we begin, begin exploring reality, searching for the truth and clashing for the truth, we'll, we'll, and, accept, and realizing that uh, that's acceptable, that we're clashing for the truth, they're searching for the truth, fighting for the truth, is you're warring for the truth with your sort of truth, whatever you want to call it. When we, when we uh, stand on that ground and we're, we're willing to to uh, you know, cut through the illusions and find the truth, you will have made great strides in, in uh, unity and the realization of unity. For example, science would say we are one people. Science would say we are one, we are one human family, yet somehow, and that's the truth, and somehow we refuse to accept that truth. There is some there's some questions as far as what, what we do and what we don't do and what's real and what's not real. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay. Someone else want to share some, um, some thoughts, feelings? Yeah, I, I'd like, I really like that. I'm intrigued by your question, Jan, by Jan's question. I'd love to hear other thoughts on that because I think that this is probably the primary evolutionary challenge that we're facing now is how we make these decisions um, because when there's differences of view. And so to me, I mean, one of the, we're moving into a more scientific age, um, but of course science isn't what science has to change as well because we have to have true um, evidence-based medicine. Um, and because more and more um, professions, so for example, you've raised vaccines, so therefore more and more approaches, what used to be called traditional approaches, what are new in terms are called traditional approaches to medicine, um, subtle approaches to medicine, um, you know, allopathic science um, approaches to medicine. The skill of thought to me is deepening in all levels in all these different approaches. And therefore we have to go through a long period to reach, as you say, David, to, 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 to come to some understanding of what truth is. And even then probably there'll be differences, but that's who we are as a species where we're not, um, we're divine in potential, but we are not, but, and that means we are, we are all in process of becoming who we are. And so globally, it's as if, a, a, to me, a great meditation is undergoing in consciousness and the different voices are becoming wiser, more intelligent, and being increasingly inspired by their principles. So orthodox science, more and more scientists are, are able to see that the paradigms they've worked in are actually antagonistic to scientific principles. And therefore truly looking from outside in. 
uh, metaphysicians are truly looking deeply from inside out. And I don't think that, I mean, I, but I, I really appreciate that question if I look at vaccines, because each one of us will have an opinion, you know, and, and they won't all be the same. So the, that's why freedom and this thing of, of the tradition that I come from um, sees evolution as moving towards right human relations. It's almost a Buddhist idea, but this idea of relationships on the vertical arm between the elements of the divine and the horizontal arm, and all our, all our relationships as human beings with the earth, with other humans, with intimate relationships and so on, um, will come into a measure of balance. And that obviously is something, it's an initiation, and that's something that doesn't happen just like that, so through some um, apparent outer magic, that happens through, th as more and more human beings are taking responsibility to have discussions like this with, their with everybody, not be afraid of them, and try and respect, but try and lift the quality to evidence-based, you know, what's the evidence, um, what's for the good of the whole? What's the greatest good of the whole? Um, that's where we need to move, I think. Anyway, it's, it, it's, I, I really enjoy that question. I don't have an answer. No, shut up. It's hard to do. Thanks, Steve. You don't have to shut up. You, you just have to mute. It's okay. <laughs> Any, anyone's? like to share? Dean, like to share? No, I was just going to say that if anybody did, they could just raise their hand or unmute themselves. Okay. Meanwhile, if you like, I can offer some uh, reflections. Meanwhile, someone uh, steps in. So um, there is this quote from Gandhi. I mean, I think uh, polarization, just to put in context, uh, polarization right now is a great illness of our democratic societies and it leads to, it leads to um, us being stuck really in evolution. You cannot, you cannot move forward if we are divided. So, um, I think being able to, and it has a lot to do with uh, partisanship or what has been called a competitive or adversarial democracy when it's, it tends to bring some people against other, like the majority will win and it will impose uh, its view. So there is this, um, and there are some new mechanisms now to deal with that, now to improve the, the deliberation, involve citizens which are less polarized and those that represent us and wants to compete for our votes. So that's one way to, to decrease uh, polarization. Um, the quote from Gandhi is, uh, the science of nonviolence can alone lead one to pure democracy. I think it's interesting considering also that for Gandhi, nonviolence is truth and uh, basically, and um, and he says like, he says, uh, God is truth. And I think he said, but even truth is God because some people do not believe in God, <laughs> but they can be believe in truth. So yeah, and I, and I developed that on my, on my, on my chapter on governance. Uh, how can we heal that uh, polarization? And, um, and that's really, you know, uh, I think it, it relates a lot to the politics of being because nonviolence, you know, to pure democracy, that means democracy means involving people in decision making. And, but people need to grow as human beings, as citizens, so that it can lead to good governance. And we have to learn uh, the values of respect of how do we manage our conflicts in a non-violent manner. And um, we can be in disagreement but about ideas, but that uh, does not mean we need to, um, you know, speak uh, bad of others. We can separate, distinguish between ideas and people. 
Um, so yeah, I think it's a really a fundamental question for our uh, democratic um, systems. May I? Sure. I had three thoughts, um, and I'll be very brief. First, Alenka's thought about the Haiti visit, and I was thinking. It would be nice to take the CEO of Boeing, Lockheed Martin, uh, Smith & Wesson, all these arms companies, and let them spend some time where their bombs are being dropped. So that yeah, might... Yeah, they should. Uh, Actually, they should. Um, <laughs> because it's, it's one of the most profitable industries on the planet, unfortunately. Um, uh, so anyway, that's, another, that's the issue on arms, because I'm a little bit involved in this element. Uh, second thought was just to share with you uh, on this issue of growth because the Iranian uh, philosopher Ali Shariati, uh, he also makes this interesting distinctions in terms of uh, how society is run uh, between management of society. Um, so, you know, providing enough houses, jobs, etc., but just managing people, allowing them to exist and quote unquote consume or live, etc. But each in its own atomized unit uh, versus leadership of society. So providing not only just the bare necessities and creating an extra person to perform a function, but also for them to, to be lead, to grow, to become, to go from, to become. And the latter is very rare in our both modern society history and also before that. So it's very difficult to, um, in, a, in a sense, radicalize towards that direction because it's quite, it's quite a challenging one you, uh, given our uh, uh, democratic processes. And the third one was on the issue of culture. And so, uh, and how to bring consensus because that's the issue we're talking about. Part of it is that we, we engage in dialogue and we're engaging in words and words are linked to the left brain and the left brain is the more distinct, sharper um, part of our being versus the right brain, which is the whole. So part of it is that the tools we're using is also <laughs> more head-based than heart-based in terms of our democratic dialogue. And we have to maybe think about literally <laughs> and feel about what are the ways to balance uh, that uh, in terms of in expanding our uh, discussions, both verbally and also heart-based and also action-based. So sometimes in, um, especially in my cultural background, that also comes from doing together. So the exercise of doing, of building together, that's mm -hmm. where some of that comes from uh, versus the sort of verbal debate and um, having an egoic argument. So those are the three, and I hope I was brief. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Maybe yeah. one question to Lynn. What time are we supposed to end? Are we supposed to end soon, or do we have a... Well, we, we can end any time. Um, our next session is an open session, and it starts at the top of the hour. Um, we have now been going for an hour and 45 minutes. So um, if we want to wrap it up now would be a good time to do that. Could I share something with you please first? Absolutely. Okay, it's just important, I guess, for me to share. So I, I like to bring the soul into the conversation, believing that we are soul and eternal and that we're here to reflect that our soul reflects divinity. Um, and that uh, uh, the, so I'll share something with you from my faith, a word, word of God, if you want to call that. And it goes as follows Oh, my friends, have ye forgotten that true and radiant morn when in those hollowed and blessed surroundings ye were all gathered in my presence beneath the shade of the tree of life? which is planted in the all-glorious environment. I struck ye listen as I gave utterance to these three most holy words. O friends, prefer not your will to mine, 
never desire that which I have not desired for you, and approach me not with lifeless hearts, defiled with worldly desires and cravings. Would ye but sanctify your souls, ye would at this present hour recall that place and those surroundings, and the truth of my utterance should be made evident unto all of you. My thought is that within all of us is a is a memory uh, that we will it will live again. It will unite us and, and restore the balance. Thank you for letting me serve. Thank you, David. Dominic, you want to say a word also to conclude? Um, I think I, I did have some thoughts, but it's probably not the right time to speak them now. Um, so, but thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the presentation. Thank you to your co-hosts as well. Thank you, Dominic. And we can follow the, the conversation uh, later. Uh, um, yeah. And um, thank you, Lean, and uh, all the people that uh, contribute to this uh, time together, Noel, uh, facilitator. Um, thank you all, and um, enjoy your time at World Unity Week. And we have some other session uh, as part of the Secular Council uh, Convergence Room. Maybe I can offer a last uh, sound to close the session. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.